Good evening. Good evening, my brother. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Steve. God bless you, Webster. Thank you for joining tonight. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started. The Bible says where there's two or three gathered in his name, he's in the midst. And I really believe that the presence of God is here with us tonight and that he is, uh, we're going to continue our study from the book, The Battlefield of the Mind. And I really believe it's going to be enriching to your souls and give you some information to help change the way we think and the way we live our lives that we be those living sacrifices the word talks about, that we present ourselves to, before the Lord, allow his presence to have dominion and authority in our hearts to change us every day. There's so much going on in our lives, and the enemy does everything in his power to keep us in a place of fear, doubt, and unbelief. But we are greater. We're greater in the Lord because God is on our side, and the enemy cannot stop. Nothing God has has began to perform in our lives, but the word says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And it's such a pri privilege and an honor to know that we have the right to come before God every day and to worship his holy, awesome name, to give him glory, to thank him for his blessings of health and strength. It's so much that God does for us throughout the day. And sometimes we neglect to praise him. But when we think about if it had not been for God waking us up this morning, we wouldn't be here today. And that's one reason why I love doing these teachings because it keeps me on focus and keep me on point to always remind myself to have a transformative mindset. If we don't change our minds on a daily, a daily routine, we'll find ourselves drifting back into the fortitude or the fortresses of the enemy where he imprisoned us in our mindsets of sin, doubt, fear, and unbelief. And when crisis came to bring us the victory, sometimes we don't maintain our victory. We give our victory to the enemy. And God wants us to know tonight that, hey, he conquered all of our foes. He has won again when he rose from the dead in our stead, that we can have the new life. And because of his grace and his mercy, we're here to give God the praise. So let us open up in prayer. Give me one moment. Turn this music down. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for your presence, God, dwelling in our midst. I thank you, God, for your, your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. I thank you for the anointing, God, that's being uh, activated in our hearts tonight, O oh God, to hear and receive the word of the Lord. And I thank you, God, that the anointing is destroying the yokes and removing the burdens, O oh God, the things that any thought that will hold us in captivity and keep us imprisoned by the things of the past, the, the things, Father God, that we've done wrong. Father, you set us free when you paid the price on the cross for our redemption. And therefore, whom Son is set free is free indeed. We receive it by faith, the liberty that we're able to walk in it every day, to recognize that, God, that you're on our side and that you greater he that's in us and he that's in the world. And because, Father God, of the world, the vice of the world, activity and things that are going around us, we can maintain a righteous stand by dwelling in the secret place of the most high God in your presence, God. And we know that this is the confidence we have in you, God. Anything we ask in that name, Jesus, that you would do. And we thank you, God. Now speak to our hearts tonight, O oh God, by divine revelation from the Logos. O oh God, give us a revelation. Give us, Father God, the unfolding of the mysteries of the gospel to help transform our lives and our thought life, O oh God, and the way we even speak words out of our mouths, that everything would change, O oh God. 
that we will learn how, Father God, to recognize that our conversations need to be seasoned with the salt of the Holy Spirit, that we speak words of life and not death, even over ourselves and over other people and over our families, over our children, over our communities, over our nation, God, that we speak in agreement what you said in your word, Father God, that you came to give life and that more abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Again, I thank you all for tuning in tonight. Hey, Cornell, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. You know, I was a scripture that came to my spirit tonight. It's Proverbs 12, 25. We've been talking about since last week, an anxious and a worried mind. An anxious and a worried mind. And it's from the book, The Battlefield of the Mind, chapter 12. And as we've been going through this book for, throughout the last uh, several months, it's been very vital to our spiritual growth to really uh, attain this word, apply this word to our hearts, allow the word to begin to transform our thinking. Because the problem a lot of believers have in today's society is they quit to give up on God and agree with what the devil says about them. And God wants us to know tonight that anxiety, that's a form of fear, that's a form of, of, the, of doubt. And we get in the place in our hearts where we start doubting God's word, we, we doubt God's ability to even change, to, uh, to change our lives, to keep our lives, to perform his work in our lives. We, be, we begin to doubt God in many ways that we would not trust him in his word. But one thing about the word of God, God's word supersedes the voice of the enemy. His word supersedes the voice of the enemy. The enemy cannot, cannot dictate to you. He cannot even uh, predict your future. He cannot tell you how things are going to be in your life. All he can do is whisper lies in your ear. And when he speaks to us, if we don't know the word of God, then we're taking his gospel. That's one thing God uh, spoke to me on Sunday when I was ministering to church, that a lot of times we get into agreement with the enemy's voice and the things he says about us that's contrary to the word of God, and we call it gospel. When God said the gospel is salvation, True salvation, preaching the gospel is salvation. And that's salvation for mankind, for whoever believes, you know, that Jesus Christ died, buried, rose again from the dead, you can receive salvation. That's the gospel. And we have to get in ourselves that, hey, no matter what the enemy brings to present to us, I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to give in to it. I'm not going to receive it. Matter of fact, I'm going to return to the sender. Anxiety and worry are both attacks on the mind intended to distract us from serving the Lord. We talked about this last week, how the enemy knows what tools to bring in your life that's an instrument to stop you from trusting and depending on God. So if he can get you distracted and distorted in your mindset, he can control your destiny. And that's what the enemy wants to do. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Proverbs 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a, but a good encouraging word make it glad. In the King James, it says it like this. Heaviness in the heart of a man make it stoop. Heaviness in the heart of a man make it stoop. In other words, make it satin. But a good word make us glad. A good word make us glad. That's what God says about us tonight, that when we receive the word of the Lord, it should put some excitement and some joy inside of your heart because the word of God, it, it give you the strength and the ability to press on in the midst of this disappointments and discouraging situations, even when folk talk about you and, and they, they slander you and they, they dog you out, they backstab you, they curse you out, all these things will make your heart worried and anxious. And when you get into a place of being anxious, you're trying to figure out how I can fix it myself without God's help. And God wants us to know tonight that you got to keep on pressing on. You got to remember that anxiety in a heart's man will weigh you down. It'll make you sick. One scripture says, <clears throat> excuse me, a merry heart does good like medicine and a broken spirit dries the bones because the enemy knows if I can get you in a place where you get saddened, I can bring discouragement, not only discouragement, but I can bring you to a place of fear, doubt, and unbelief where you don't trust God's word. 
So we're going to continue where we left off last week in our book, in chapter 12, page 109 in the book. Page 109. We're going to continue. We talked about last week is life, it is not life greater than things. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 was the key verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. And one thing about Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, he used the analogy of natural resources and things that people do to bring them to a place to think about what worry is going to do for you. And it's all defined in the end that worry cannot change nothing in your life. Anxiety and worry works hand in hand because they both are distressing to the heart. And when they get into your heart, it pulls you from your purpose. It pulls you from the destiny. It pulls you from the call in your life. It makes you start focusing on everything else, but focusing on what God says about you. God's word supersedes the voice of the enemy every day of our lives. You need to write that down. God's word supersedes the voice of the enemy every day of our lives. And when we get into the word of God, I say it in our church all the time, you need to get into the word of God. And what I mean by that, study the word of God, meditate on the word of God, speak the word of God, know the word of God. Because when you get the word inside of you, and when you are faced with oppositions and the, and the opportunity to worry, to get discouraged, to become faint-hearted, to want to quit, want to give up, the word would give you an encouraging and exciting rhema word from the heart of God that will help you push in the midst of adversity. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversities, your strength is small. That means you have no ability to stand. And one thing about Paul, when Paul wrote to the church, of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through the latter part of that chapter, he talked about the importance of dressing yourself up daily with the full armor of God. You got to get the word. You got to get in the word. In order to be clothed with the full armor of God, you got to know the word of God. Because the word of God is that armor that defends you against every onslaught, every attack, every assassination, every plan of the enemy that he has that he has assigned to take you out. His MO is to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to take you out. But you got to know the word of God that God's word supersedes the voice of the enemy in your life. The devil is a liar. No matter what he speaks, the contrary to God's word, I will not listen to it. I will not obey it. I will, not, I will shut it down. I rebuke that word in the name of Jesus because I will continually trust in the Lord my God who has the ability to keep me pressing on. One thing about God, none of these things that happen in our lives takes God by happenstance. It doesn't take him, catch him off guard. It doesn't sneak up on God. Every plan and plot of the enemy that he brings against you as a believer, God already knows before it happens. And that's the reason why it's very important. Listen to me now. It is very important as a believer, a child of God, to meditate. Get in the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Joshua 1 and 8 tells you about meditation. Not only that, speak the Word of God over yourself, over your business, over your dreams, over your vision. Everything that God has given you to do in this life, you got to speak the Word over that and deem that it's going to come to pass what God has given you to do. He says every vision... You need to write it down, make it plain to all who may see it, may run with it. He said, though it tarry, yet it will surely come to pass. The word of God will come to pass in your life when you trust in him and you stand on God and put God in, his, in remembrance of his word. Say, God, you said in your word 
that I'm blessed and highly favored of God. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. It doesn't matter what it looks like, God. You said I would prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. And I guarantee when you respond to God according to his word, God will back up his word. God says every word that proceeds out of his mouth will not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which he pleased and prosper where he has sent it. That's what God does for us as a believer. He backs his word up. He speaks his word over you. He stands on his word. He assures his word that his word will manifest in our lives. But the problem is we're not getting in the word. We watch television. We listen to other people. We do everything contrary to the word of God. But when you get the word inside of you, the word will prosper. The word will manifest. The word will come to pass in your life. God promises that his word would not return to him void. So it's up to you as a believer to study the word of God and know the word of God. Amen. So going on a little further. Let's see here. So why be so anxious? Why be so anxious? Why should you be anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his magnificence, excellence, dignity, and grace was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and green and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace, would he... Would he not much more surely close you? O oh, you of little faith. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through 30. So if God says, if God is able, Jesus said, if God is able to take care of his creation, are you not better than his creation? God has the power and the ability to do what he chooses to bring the past in your life to prosper you, to cause you to be successful, to cause your business to expand, to enlarge your territory, everything you're trusting God to do, God promises that I'm a God who his, his El should die. I'm the God who's more than enough. If God is El should die, then why do we doubt God? Isn't God able to perform his word in, a, in your life? Go to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55 verse 11. Isaiah 55 verse 11. In Isaiah 55 verse 11, it says, So shall my word be. What you need God's word to be in your life tonight? What is it you're trusting, expecting God to do for you tonight? God says, so shall my word be. So if I need God to be my finances, he says his word would do that. If I need God to be my healer, his word would do that. If I need God to be my guidance, his word would do that. If I need God's word to be my wisdom and my understanding, his word would do that. Because he says, so shall my word be. That goes forth. That means it comes out of the mouth of God to wherever he wanted to go into your life, in the life of your children, the life of your family, the life of your community, the life of our nation. God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. He said, it shall not. I love this part about this scripture. It shall not. Return unto me void. In other words, without producing any effect in your life. God says his word would not come back to him void without being productive in your life. Every word that God speaks over you, it goes into you. 
It comes out of you. It produces fruit out of your life. It causes your mind to be transformed. The more you study God's word, the mindset begins to change. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world or squeeze into the world system, but be you transformed. That means change, metamorphosis, by the renewing of what? Your mind, by the Spirit of God. God's Word has the power and the ability to change your thought life. So many folk in the body of Christ are so negative. So many folk in the body of Christ, they're gossipers, they're backbiters, they're haters, they're jealous, they're envy of you. All because you do what you do to please God with your life. The life you live says that we live by the faith of the Son of God. So if my life is in Christ Jesus, then why do folk get jealous of me? Why do folk hate on me? Why do folk talk about me? Because evidently, and this is what God told me Sunday, said when folk are slandering and talking about you and backbiting and hating on you, evidently you're doing something right. Because the enemy doesn't mess with people who are not doing anything right for God. He messes with those who are, who are weak-minded, who are sitting on the sidelines, who are lukewarm, who are straddling the fence. Those are the ones he's going to attack the most because he knows they're already on his team. He's not going to attack them. He, those are the ones he won't attack. I mean, correction. Those are the ones he will not attack because they're already on his team. But the ones who are on God's side, <coughs> who's doing the work of the kingdom, who's a threat to his kingdom, those are the ones he looked for who are who can find a foothold of vulnerability to get into their lives. He wants to find a breach in your heart. If he can find a breach in your heart, he can stop you in your track and cause you to revert back to the old nature, that dead man, and resurrect it again. But the Bible tells us that if we desire to come after Christ, we must deny ourselves, die to ourselves daily, take up our cross and follow him. And the enemy knows, he knows where you are in your faith. God has given to every man a measure of faith. He knows some people's faith is strong. Some, some people's faith is, is a, a medium. Some folks' faith are weak. You know, he knows exactly where you are. If your faith is lukewarm, if you're stagnant in your faith, and he'll know when the right moment to come and attack you. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know what's going on in my throat tonight. Yo, excuse me, just pray for me. But the devil's alive, he's not going to stop this word from going forth. So when the enemy comes to attack you, it's very important that you listen to the voice of the Lord. You hear what I said? Listen to the voice of the Lord and allow the voice of the Lord to transform your thought life to begin to get into agreement with what God says about you and not what the enemy says to you. Because the devil will do everything in his power to stop you in your track if you let him. Verse 20 in Proverbs chapter 12 said, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace, to the counselors of peace is joy. So deceit is in the heart of those who imagine to do evil. That means people just laying up in their bed, they're pondering in their mind, what can I do to hurt somebody else? So worrying about what people might think about you, having a preconceived idea about folk, it's not going to change anything. People are going to be people. Folk going to get offended. Folk going to lie on you. They're going to slander you. They're going to persecute you. But Jesus went through the greatest suffering ever. He led the example for us today that all we have to do is walk in the finished work of the cross and stand in the victory and see him at work in our lives every day. Satan sends out demons whose job is to do nothing but repeat that phrase in the believer's ear all day long. What are we going to do? Satan wants you to have a question in your mind. What are we, we going to do? How am I going to get out of this situation? How am I going to fix this problem? I done got myself in a jam. How am I going to get out of this? What, what strategy can I use now? What lie can I tell? Because he'll come up with all kinds of excuses 
to fix your own situation without seeking God's face. Come to him in repentance. Because he knows that repentance is the key to get you in right standing with God. And when you get into a place of repentance, true repentance, he knows right then and there, it shuts him down from attacking you. So when he comes, his attack doesn't have any, any more power to influence you or to turn you from your faith. So you got to keep on moving forward. Notice the part of verse 31 in which the Lord instructs us not to worry or to be anxious. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Seek God and not gifts. For the Gentiles, heathens, wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows well that you need, need them all. But seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things taken together will be given you besides. God knows what you need before you ask him. He knows how to bring things to your life. He knows how to open doors in your life. He knows how to show you favor in your life. When you trust him by seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything we need, every precious promise, every blessing God has for us is already attached to the word of God. And because it's attached to the word of God, we're able to stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. Because in him, we're able to overcome anything the enemy brings our way. It is clear that God's children are not to be like the world. The world seeks after things, but we are to seek after the Lord. You hear what I said? The world seeks after things, but we are to seek after the Lord. He has promised that if we would do his will, he would add to us all these things he knows we need. That's a guarantee from God. That's an assurance you can go to bank on that anything I need, God promises when I do his will, by seeking his kingdom and seeking his righteousness, seeking his presence. God promises everything you need, he will supply. Our heavenly father delights in giving his children good things, but only if, we're, only if we are not seeking after them. Seek is a strong word meaning to pursue, to crave, and go after with all of your might. How many times... <clears throat> You wanted that relationship so bad, or you wanted to get that job so bad, or you want a certain certain des uh, dessert so bad, or a certain food so bad, till so you craved it, you desired it, you wanted it with all your might, until you satisfy that craving. You went and got like one day I wanted barbecue, and I was like, I, I want me, I just feel like I want a barbecue sandwich today, and I, I would not rest in my mind until I got that barbecue sandwich. So I sought that thing with all my heart with a desire to get that barbecue sandwich until I brought it to fruition. And that's how we do with the things of the world. Without God, we'll seek the things of the world, we'll pursue it, we'll crave after it, we'll go after it. And when God is saying, that ain't what I want for you. I got something greater. I got something better for you. And all you got to do is just seek me. And when you seek God, because without him, Nothing else has any value. When you seek God, God puts value on the things in your life that you desire and want. That's the God we serve. The God who knows what we desire and he knows what we want. And God promises when our desires line with his word, he will, he will give us what we want. And that's what we have to do every day is trust God at his word, stand on his word, believe his word, and do not down our hearts. And know with an assurance that my God will supply all my needs according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God knows what we need before we ask him. God knows what we need before we ask him. If we simply make our request known to him, as Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 states, he will bring them to pass in his own good timing. So whatever it is we need from God, 
God will bring it past in your life in his own timing. When he knows that you are in a mindset, you're in the heart and the attitude to receive what he wants to give you. One thing about God, he's not going to give you something that he knows you're not ready for that's going to destroy you. He'll wait till you matured. When you grew to the, the level of degree in the Christianity, you walk with God where he can trust you, what you ask for, and he give it to you. So you got to make sure that your desires line up with the word of God. Don't fret or have anxiety. Don't fret or have anxiety. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition, definite request. With thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. This is an amplified version. The amplified version. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. So you got to make sure that you're not getting to a place where you're fretting, you're fainting, you're full of anxiety, full of worry, but you're praying about everything and you're casting all your cares at the feet of the Lord and let him deal with it. Because one thing about God, he can fix your problem better than you can. He can handle all the weight. We can't take all the pressure. We can't take all the weight. We Sometimes we become like a pressure cooker. We get so much stuff bombarding our mindsets, it causes us to explode on the wrong person. Because I let so much stuff fester inside of me till I began pressed down and it got pressed and pressed and pressed. And then when a moment comes where I had enough, I explode on the wrong person. So you got to pray about everything and cast your cares on the Lord. Cast down imaginations. Cast down imaginations. And this is an amplified version. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Let me turn here to my other Bible as well. And it reads in the King James, <clears throat> casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In the, King, in the Amplified Version, it says refute arguments. That means stand against it, cast it down. And theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. That is good. I love the way it's written there. When the thoughts being offered to uh, offer you do not agree with, with the word of God, the best way to shut down the devil is to speak the word of God. When thoughts are being offered to you, do not agree with the word of God. The best way to silence the voice of the enemy is to speak the word of God like Jesus did in Luke chapter 4, verse 4. He said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When you speak the word of God, the enemy has no choice but to back off, to leave you alone for a season. Hear what I said? He'll leave you alone for a season until you find another moment where you're vulnerable, another moment where you're easy, another moment where you can get in and get a foothold. But when you're standing firm, rooted and grounded in the faith, the enemy cannot touch you. He cannot stop you. He cannot defy the word of God because every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God will not come to God empty, void, without making effect in your life. The word of God will silence the mouth of the enemy even when you're hurting. The voice of the Lord through his word will silence the mouth of pain, will silence the mouth of hurt, silence the mouth of disappointment. The word of God will supersede any voice of the enemy that will come to destroy you. Cast your cares upon God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And it says, in the King James, it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. Verse 7, 
casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, not upon your friend, not upon your neighbor, not upon, upon your family, not upon your boss, not upon associates, but upon him who Christ, the Messiah. Every concern, every pain that we feel, every disappointment, every discouraging moments of our lives, he said we have the right and the privilege to cast it off of ourselves. In other words, take the weight off of yourself and put it on him because he can bear it for you. Why? Because he cares for you. If he cares about you, then who am I to negate God's word? Who am I to defy God's word by worrying of having anxiety in my heart? The Amplified puts it this way. So therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation. You know how sometimes we see ourselves pompous and highly lifted up above other people we feel we're better than somebody else? He said, you got to come to the lower state in the mind of Christ. Under the mighty hand of God, that in due time, he may exalt you. God will lift you up when you're humble. God will promote you when you're humble. God will show you favor when you're humble. God will increase your faith when you're humble. Then it goes on to say, casting the whole, not part of your care, not a piece of your cares, not an increment of your cares, casting the whole of your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. I love it. Because there was a time in my life I worried about everything and prayed less about anything. There was a time in my life I was an introvert. I kept stuff to myself so much, bottled in all the pains and disappointments, the discouragements, the hurts, the things done to me, people done to me. I kept all that bottled in inside. And I would always find myself exploding on somebody at a certain time in my life. And when I got a revelation, as I matured in the things of God, start studying the word of God, knowing the word of God, devouring the word of God, then I was able to like the words of old taste and see that the Lord is good. Bless the man who trusts him. And when I got that revelation that God's word is good, it's like, it's like honey on a honeycomb. It's sweeter than honey on a honeycomb. It's medicine to my body. God's word began to manifest. And the word began to change my thought life. Then I started learning how to do just what it says here. Take all my anxieties. <coughs> I was very fearful at one time. I wouldn't even walk in the dark alley at night time. I wouldn't even walk down the street by myself without fearing. Because I was always worried about somebody going to do something to me. Somebody going to hurt me. Somebody going to attack me. Those are the voice of the enemy. And when I got the revelation that all my anxieties, all the stuff I'm troubled about, and all my worries, the weights, and all those things I'm concerned about, I can cast it on the Lord. That was the most phenomenal thing I could have heard in my life. That I can cast all this stuff that I had on the inside of me onto the Lord. For he cares for you affectionately. He cares for you affectionately. In other words, God loves you so much. He has an affection for you. He has a desire for you. He has a concern for you. So everything that I, I have in me now, I cast on him. And it says, and he cares about you watchfully. God watches over you. He watches over his word to perform it in your life. And God knows just what's bothering you. And he knows how to fix it. And that is so exciting. That's good news. To know that God cares about everything I care about. And one thing, I was in a hospital one time. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to me. He said, why are you worried about things that are not in your power to change? 
Why are you worried about things that are not in your power to change? He said, if you're going to worry about it, then I don't need to do anything about it. But he said, if you let me take care of it, all you got to do is rest. And you know, that was the issue that God had with the children of Israel in the wilderness. He says they failed to enter into his rest because of unbelief. Anxiety and worrying is a form of unbelief because it prevents you from trusting God's ability to save you. And when God gave me that revelation, I said, oh my God, there's a lot of church folk in error because we all do the same thing. We worry about stuff. We're concerned about stuff. We're concerned about somebody else's issues. And that's another, another thing God revealed to me. Sometimes we get so bombarded by other people's issues. Don't even be your issue. Don't be your problem. Be somebody else's problem. But you're so worried about it. And God says, why are you worried about somebody else's issues? What you need to do is pray for them to be delivered from their issues. And when you cast it upon the Lord, God can handle it better than what you can and bring them out victoriously in the proper time and the season. When the enemy tries to give us a problem, we have the privilege of casting upon God. The word cast actually means to pitch or to throw. You and I can pitch or throw our problems to God. Believe me, he can catch them. He knows what to do with them and what he shall do to bring you out. God knows all about you. God has the remedies. I heard this a few weeks ago. When God spoke to me in the spirit. So I got the remedy to everything you go through in life. God said, so I got your healing. I got your finances. I got your strength. I got the power over temptation. So I got the power to change your mind. He says, I have the remedy to everything that you would allow to trouble you or, or, or take concern in your life. He said, I can bring you out better than what you can. But then it goes on and says, this passage lets us know that to humble ourselves is not to worry. To humble ourselves is not to worry. A person who worries still thinks that in some way he can solve his own problems. A person who worries thinks within himself they can solve their own problem. Isn't that something? You need to write that down. A person who worries still thinks that in some way he can solve his own problem. Worry is the mind racing around trying to find a solution to his situations. Worry is the mind racing around trying to find a solution to his situation. The proud man is full of himself while the humble man is full of God. The proud man is full of himself. That's the one that's, that's lifted up in pride, haughty, arrogant, selfish, self-righteous. While the humble man is full of God. The proud man worries. The humble man waits. The proud man worries. The humble man waits. And God don't want us to worry about anything. He wants to get in the place where we wait on God. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. That's what God says in his word. So you got to get in the place where you sit down and wait on God. But in the process of waiting, you wait with an expectation. To wait on God don't mean I'm going to sit down and do nothing. Waiting on God means I'm going to sit down, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to consecrate, I'm going to seek the face of God, I'm going to keep on doing what God required me to do to perfect my mindset on a daily basis with the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. And God will deliver us. God will change us. God will set us free. And the enemy knows that if I can keep you in a place of bondage, I can stop you from pursuing what God has for you to do in your life. Many ministries that in your loins have not come to pass. Many businesses in your loins have not come to pass because of worry. And God wants us to get to the place where we expect God to do something great in our lives, to pour in our lives the promises and favor to come forth through our lives, to meet our every need financially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, 
Everything we need is all wrapped up, tied up in Jesus and tangled up in Jesus. Our God, you would not exercise judgment upon them for, for we have no might to stand against this great company that is coming against us. <clears throat> we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. The second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. And this is when King Jehoshaphat was seeking God when he found out about all the invading armies were coming against him in Second Chronicles chapter 20. He found all these invaded armies were coming from every side against him in his kingdom. And he told God, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That is excellent news to know that even when the enemy bombards my mind with other people issues, I have issues of my own and stuff coming against me. My finances are depreciated. My health is getting sick. My mind getting confused. All this stuff. I still can set my eyes on the Lord and watch God turn things around in my favor. That's all we have to do is keep trusting God and stand on God's word. The people in it had to come to the place of realizing three things for certain. They had no might against the enemies. They did not know what to do. And they needed to have their eyes focused on God. We can apply this to our lives today. When the enemy brings us situations, troubles and trials and tests and problems and issues, the three things we can recognize, I don't have the might to stand against the enemy in my own strength. I don't know what to do. And then I can focus my eyes on God who knows exactly what to do and how to do it to bring me through. God will see you through it. God will carry you through it. He will bring you through it. God will see you through it. He will carry you through it. He will bring you through it. Doesn't matter what it is in your life. All you got to do is, is Mark 11th chapter verse 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. In other words, have the God kind of faith. When you have the God kind of faith, you can overcome anything the enemy brings your way. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In verse 15 and 17 of the same passage, we see what the Lord said to them once they came to, their, to this realization and freely acknowledged it to him. Be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your positions, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15 and 17. Be not afraid. You do not have to fight. Be still and see the deliverance of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful news? To know when I'm faced with oppositions, strongholds, try to get a hold of me from the things of the past. People want to come to influence and test and try me. I can stand still. I don't need to fight in this battle. I don't have to be afraid in this battle. Because my God would bring forth his delivering power to overcome the voice of the enemy. So what is our position? It is one of worship and abiding in Jesus and entering the rest of God. The very thing I just talked about previously. It's getting into the place of worship, abiding in Jesus, and entering to God's rest. It is one waiting on the Lord continually with our eyes focused on him, doing what he directs us to do, and otherwise having a reverential fear of moving in the flesh. A reverential fear of moving in the flesh. In other words, not giving to the flesh. Concerning entering God's rest, I would like to say this. There is no such thing as the rest of God without opposition. There is no such thing as the rest of God without opposition. If you choose to get into a place of resting in God, in the finished work of the cross, the redemption plan of God, he provided for you in your life, 
You have to get to the place in yourself where you just get in a position to receive oppositions. You get in position to receive oppositions with the victory knowing it's already won and that God has already defeated that battle in your life and led you into victory. Unbelievers have no peace during easy time, but the rest of God is the gift that keeps believers peaceful during times of trouble. The rest of God is the gift that keeps believers peaceful during the times of trouble. It is a gift from him to his children. So the rest of God is a gift for you and for me. And all we have to do is just sit down, receive it by faith, walk in it, trust God in his word, and know that God has the power and the ability to keep me from falling and present me fault before his, his majesty and his presence on high. God himself, he's right there inside of you, leading you into victory, helping you stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to pick this up on next week. This is a really great lesson. And I pray that something been said thus far to help encourage you to edify you, to stir you up, to motivate you, to convict you, to strengthen you, and to empower you to get in the Word of God and know the Word of God for yourself. Not hearsay or he say, she say, but read it for yourself. If you don't know how to read, get an audio Bible. The audio Bible will do just as well as declaring the Word of God in your spirit because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, Lord God, tonight I thank you for this lesson tonight, oh God. I pray that it have not fallen upon deaf ears, but the word will bring transformation of mind, body, soul, and spirit, oh God, that we learn how to yield ourselves to you, humble ourselves for the mighty hand of God, that you would lift us up in due season. Forgive us for the times we failed to trust you and the times we failed to walk by faith and we walked in unbelief. And help us, God, tonight to do better, to change the way we think, by renewing our minds by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we do each week, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you acknowledging that I am a sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly, and to wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you for cleansing me and I thank you, Lord God, that now you release the Holy Spirit in my heart to lead me and to guide me into all truth and bring back to my remembrance the things where I have been taught of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You prayed that prayer. Welcome to the family of God. You stay excited. Don't let the enemy deceive you, stop you in your track. But you keep on moving forward in the promises of God's word. And know that God is on your side and that he's the greater one that lives and abides you. And no matter what the enemy brings your way, the devil cannot stop you from receiving what God has for you. The blessings and the promises that God has already promised in his word that is yours. That you can receive it by faith and know that it's a guarantee that God will not change his mind about his promises, but they will surely come to pass in your life. Until next week, God bless you. Shalom. If you have any questions, feel free to inbox me a question, and I will answer that question in next week's lesson. If you have a question, feel free to inbox me, and I will answer that question in our next, next week's lesson, or I'll send you a message in response through Messenger. All right, God bless. Have a good night. Walk by faith, not by sight. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Go make it a great evening on purpose and for purpose. In Jesus' name, shalom, peace be unto you.